So let me, uh, first up, just by quickly uh, sketching out an agenda, I would like for a lot of folks to level set on Huawei, who we are and what we do. And uh, hopefully some of you are quite familiar with us, but there certainly might be folks on the line, and we do have quite a few who might not be. Uh, my next uh, agenda item is data centers then and now, my specifically the majority of the material today. And then to follow up very quickly with the Huawei data center portfolio. What, what types of solutions do we have? Including two brief case studies of where our actual data center solution products have gone and, and had some success with customers. And finally, at the end, we will have a question and answer session in which we will attempt to address um, the questions that you do have. Uh, clearly, we will do this as time allows. So moving to my third slide then, let's quickly take a look at uh, Huawei overall business and the U.S. in focus. So Huawei, probably familiar to many of you, it's extremely familiar to most um, other countries and continents. But let me just summarize by saying that we are a leading global ICT solutions provider, information and communications technologies. Our 2012 revenue is, as I list, over $35 billion, and we do serve uh, 45 of the world's top 50 telecom operators. And the reason that's important in the enterprise is that service providers and telecom operators are some of the toughest customers you'll ever have for your gear. And if you're very strong in that space, I think that can do nothing but good things for the enterprise customer. We're deployed in over 140 countries, serving a third of the world's population, a little over two and a half billion. And we are um, also, very much of note, a top contributor to industry standards and to standards bodies. And um, I do have some statistics later on that show just how many of those bodies we either uh, chair or have a very important seat on. Looking then at Huawei in the U.S. and focus, the Huawei North American Regional Office was established in 2001 first in Plano, Texas. And then the Santa Clara R&D facility, which is much more enterprise focused, was opened in 2011. We do have established offices in key regional cities in the U.S., including Boston, New York, uh, Plano, Los Angeles. And uh, very importantly of note, we have contributed very much to the local economy. We generated over $6 billion in contracts for U.S.-based technology companies in 2012 alone. And then finally, the enterprise business itself was formally launched some of you may recall this if you were around at Interop, October 2011 in New York. And then finally, this is a question I, I get uh, quite a bit. I understand that you've got products and solutions, but you also provide a full portfolio of professional, technical, and learning services. And the answer in that case is an emphatic yes. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the webinar. So as I mentioned, Huawei is a major ICT player, and it's important to know there's a major convergence going on in our industry that combines communication technologies such as analog, digital, mobile broad and narrow band, and information technologies such as client server and client processing. The transition has been going on for quite a while, quite frankly. It's been driven by three major trends. The consumerization of IT, where more and more consumers are using technology once reserved for the enterprise. The emergence of cloud, whether that be private, public, or hybrid deployment, and the rise in workforce mobility. It's estimated, for example, that over 40% of the workforce globally in the near future will be either partially or entirely mobile. And that obviously brings an entirely new dynamic to the workplace and to items like BYOD and all those and all those dynamics that it involves. So these trends will continue, and it's not a question of if, but when they will arrive on your network. And in my opinion, if you want to really ally yourself with a vendor who is participating with this transition, because of two things, they saw it coming, and they have broad experience in all the technologies that I have mentioned. So might I suggest to you that Huawei is just such a company, and you should be considering that the fact that we have enterprise, service provider, and consumer experience allows us to cross-pollinate and learn from allied markets and bring a more effective overall solution to you. So at this point, Mitch, I've got uh, my first polling question coming up for the audience. Hey, great. So I'm launching a poll right now. Uh, everybody should see on your screen. Uh, we have, uh, how familiar are you with Huawei and its ICT solutions? And so go ahead and uh, 
answer the, the uh, questions there, and then uh, we'll share the results uh, with the audience after you're done. And we'll give everybody a few minutes here to vote. Okay, great. Looks like uh, everybody uh, pretty much voted. So, um, I'm going to close that and share it with the audience. So everybody should see. Uh, looks like um, looks like it's kind of a mix. Uh, we got 38% uh, uh, are very familiar or they're currently a customer. Um, not many are uh, very familiar, but not yet working with us. And then uh, we have a, a balance of people who are somewhat familiar and who uh, this is their first experience. So hopefully today uh, you'll get a good feel for what we're all about and uh, you'll quickly become a, a customer. So I'll turn it back over to Thomas uh, to continue uh, the presentation. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Yeah, very interesting uh, combination of results on that poll. And again, we'll have a total of three of those polling questions um, during the webinar today. Thank you very much for your responses. Let me then move on to my next um, item on the agenda, which is data centers then and now. And let me try to advance Mitch here. There we go. Thanks very much. Data centers then and now. And background to, to really understand then where data centers are going today and in the future. I think it's instructional to look at the history of where they've been and to realize that the state of the network today is very much driven by um, an older architecture that may not work today and we do need to work on evolving it. The original client server wiring closet of you know, 15, 20 years ago, which eventually became the data center and the server-to-server -server paradigm, the rise of the server-to-server -server paradigm, was built on three um, large trends or rules. Number one, 80% of traffic was uh, non-local back then and only 20% local. The, cry, the rise of the client server model began back then and really server virtualization was initially non-existent. If your servers got close to capacity, you just ordered more hardware. And now we're very much um, knowing that we do need to use our servers much more judiciously and with virtualization, traffic patterns start to change as well. And so there's much more rather than north-south traffic, there's much more east-to-west traffic driving bigger networks in that direction. And then finally, back then, um, the L2 and L3 D marks were very consistent and very well understood. And today, that's kind of blurred over time. So back then, we were entering the age of the large bridged Ethernet LAN, if some of us remember that. Um, the support, to support all of this, a thing called Spanning Tree Protocol was invented, 802.1D. And the Spanning Tree Protocol not really a, it was not really a routing protocol. It was a network protocol that ensured a loop-free topology for any bridged Ethernet local area network. The basic function of spanning tree was to prevent bridge loops and the broadcast radiation that resulted from them. Spanning tree also allowed a network design to include spare or redundant links to provide automatic backup paths if an active link failed without the danger of bridge loops or the need for manual en enabling or disabling of these backup links. So unfortunately, as those networks grew over time, 802.1D became more and more taxed and able to, to keep up with our growing network, and eventually, quite frankly, as a lot of us know, ran out of gas in its ability to keep up with our network designs. So that's in a little more detail, getting to the root of the problem of spanning tree. It's a perfectly good technology to start with, but it doesn't scale over time. It was really never intended as a robust routing protocol but it was used to avoid mostly loops and networks. So on the left of this slide, I'm showing what happened to spanning tree over time. Getting toward the end of its life uh, for usefulness, scaling under spanning tree is limited. The, uh, the, the technology of single active, single forwarding uh, lanes doesn't leave really many options. And having to pick an infrastructure strategy of L2 or L3 only really is too inflexible for modern networks. So the, really the results of all of this, what did we get ourselves into? In essence, we began having the networking infrastructure drive our application decisions. The, the way we interact with the network was too cumbersome. 
Then our behavior changes that because these changes are cumbersome, we lead to cautious changes. The caution can slow down progress uh, processes to a crawl. And really, the reality of the work is that 70 to 80 percent of the time, rather than the network being the problem, it's really human error that causes problem on networks. So specifically, the, con the consequences of inflexibility um, in a network are very much evident today. What we find is that rather than the applications and services driving what type of in infrastructure we deploy, our past traps us into having the infrastructure determine what network infrastructure we deploy, which is exactly the reverse of what we want. This leads to suboptimal network deployments over time. The infrastructure needs to be flexible to the applications, not the other way around. It also needs to be agile enough to no longer be a bottleneck or a barrier to deployment. So in summary, what have we learned? Spanning tree based on L2 is stability challenged. It fails open. Traditional bridging really isn't bridging as much as, as it's controlled flooding, not controlled forwarding. Some applications require L2, but a lot of people, quite frankly, prefer L3, and they want a way to use it consistently in the network. Multiple services should converge on a single infrastructure for efficiency. We shouldn't have to build parallel networks to make up for network infrastructure problems. At the end of the day, infrastructure needs to be flexible enough to adapt to new applications and services, our legacy applications and services, and our organizational structures. And we also have to realize that we simply can't throw bandwidth at the problem. There's never enough bandwidth, and we can't predict future application-driven requirements, so we need a very flexible infrastructure to adapt to changes over time. And at the end of the day, as we all know, in every organization, uptime has become even more critical as the network becomes more central to what the uh, corporation does for a living. So where are we today, moving forward? Four large dynamics in the industry present themselves, and any new infrastructure that we install must address. Number one, big data and distributed computing. Behind all the important trends in the past decade, including service orientation, cloud computing, virtualization, and big data, is a foundational technology called distributed computing. Simply put, without distributed computing, none of these advancements would be possible. It's a technique that allows individual computers to be networked together across geographical areas as though they were a single environment. You find many different implementations of distributed computing. In some topologies, individual computing entities simply map pass messages to each other. Trend number two, virtual machines, cloud, and work mobility. The rise of virtualization of server workloads to maximize server utilization has introduced a whole bunch of new requirements in networking. Interest in moving wor workloads as appropriate away from the IT departments into a cloud as a resource that can be used on an as-needed basis, and thus the naming of workload mobility. The desire to use more and more cloud applications rather than ones that are based inside the corporation. The other two uh, top trends are complex, multi-tiered enterprise class applications and the need to support them and the large storage networks that produce many petabytes for more organizations per year than many enterprises are now producing. What we need then to support all of this, the dynamics going forward, and what you should look for in a provider of network infrastructure are three things. Number one, scalable platforms. Number two, extensible interfaces and integration. And number three, a flexible solutions architecture. This leads to long-term adaptability of the network for generational investment. And what I mean by generational investment is making an investment in year one that will carry throughout the better part of a decade rather than rip or replace or forklift upgrade. And so those are some of the critical items I think you ought to be looking at in any new data center deployment. So what are the new options moving forward to help us scale the data center? I would suggest that there are probably three major ones you've heard about in the industry today. Layer two fabrics, or TRIL, transparent interconnect of lots of links, encapsulated overlays for those who want L2 over L3, and then finally the whole game of software-defined networking. And again, SDN is a very deep topic, and we plan to follow up with a webinar just in and of itself on SDN. But the good news here is that any of these paths, whether they be TRIL, encapsulated overlays 
or SDN can get you to the end game. And mixing and matching of these approaches is perfectly fine. Going down one road does not negate being able to go down another on your network. Let me talk about each of these in turn. So a lot of smart people, given what I talked about, a, a spanning shoot protocol and it running out of gas, have been working on a fix on the issue of STB scalability and found it in TRIL, or Transparent Interconnect of Lots of Links. TRIL is an IETF protocol standard that uses layer three routing technologies to create a large cloud of links that appear to be IP nodes to a single IP subnet. It allows a fairly large layer two, uh, two cloud to be created with a flat address space so that nodes can move within the cloud without changing their IP addresses. While using all the layer three routing techniques that have evolved over the years, including shortest paths and multipathing. Additionally, as I'm showing on the right, Troll supports layer two features such as VLANs and the ability to auto configure while allowing manual configuration if so desired and multicast and broadcast with no additional protocol. In summary, TRIL starts to directly address the problem I mentioned regarding spanning tree scale. The second technology I mentioned is a layer three routed fabric with encapsulated overlays. There will always be a subset of customer networks who want native L3 fabrics, i.e. IP routing to the access layer. And so the legacy issues on the left-hand side of this slide that are, that are, are both VMs being not able to live migrate to access IP subnets and many other problems historically in layer, uh, layer three can be, um, can be addressed via one of two methodologies. Virtual extensible LAN is an encapsulation protocol for running an overlay network on existing L3 infrastructure. An overlay network is a virtual network that is built on top of existing L2 and allows um, companies to support elastic com compute architectures. VXLAN will make it easier for engineers to scale out a cloud computing environment while logically isolating cloud apps and tenants. The other protocol, MVGRE, or network virtualization using generic routing encapsulation, is a network virtualization technology that attempts to ameliorate the scalability problems associated with large cloud computing deployments it uses GRE, or generic routing encapsulation, to tunnel layer two packets over L3 networks. So again, the concept of using this protocol to scale L2 over an existing L3 infrastructure and address legacy problems with data centers. Software-defined networking, the last technology, is in its infancy. SDN enables users to program network layers separating the control and the data plane. By enabling programmability, SDN can allow users to optimize their network resources, increase network agility, service innovation, and accelerate service time to market, as well as extract business intelligence and ultimately enabling dynamic service-driven virtual networks. Look at it in a different way. SDN is more about externalizing the controller and taking a high-end, end-to-end network perspective to deliver apps across the entire network rather than in a single device or, or uh, some other methodology. Many efforts are going on to standardize on that external controller. And for most users, they will, they will initially scale their legacy networks with Trill over an overlay approach and implement some form of SDN control over time. Vendors are in early stages of SDN delivery. It's a journey, it's not a quick sprint, and it's disruptive. So again, a lot of, you'll hear a lot from vendors regarding software-defined networks. Be sure that you have your time to test out the technologies and the techniques involved. And in the meantime, either a TRIL or an L3 approach is perfectly fine. We will, as I mentioned, have a future webinar on technologies, including SDN, in a deep dive format. And Mitch, at this point, I believe it is time for our polling question number two. Fantastic. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, our next polling question is obviously all about the technologies that you're considering. So uh, the question is, what new technologies are you considering to either replace or bolster your networking implementation? Are you looking at Trill? 
Uh, are you looking at MVGRE or VXLAN? Or are you saying, hey, look, no, none of these things are important to me at this point. S2P works great for me. Go ahead and vote on that, and then uh, we'll share the results uh, with the audience. A few more votes are coming in, so I'll, I'll give it a few more uh, few more seconds here. Okay, great. Uh, sharing this here, uh, looks like uh, for the most part, 64% uh, say, hey, STP is working great for me now. 28% um, are uh, looking at Trill, and uh, a few people are looking at MVGRE and VXLAN. So um, great feedback. Uh, a, a bit surprising. I, 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 uh, in talking to our customers, I find that more people are, are getting challenged by the traditional networking technologies. Uh, so this is a bit surprising, but uh, uh, interesting. I'll uh, turn it back over to Thomas now, and we'll continue the presentation. Yeah, Mitch, I would like to point out that uh, a great point that you make regarding a lot of the customers we talk to um, looking into the new technologies. I will make a note if I had had the same webinar this time last year or maybe even a bit before that, the numbers would have even been more skewed. So I think what we're seeing is progress over time. I think I've got something like 30-odd percent of folks considering a non-STP implementation. So I think that number continues to increase over time, Mitch, and uh, I think we'll be well north of 50 consistently in webinars, I think, by this time, probably next year. So I, I think that trend will continue. Okay, I'll try to get back and uh, advance the slides here. Okay, so uh, next section of the presentation, hopefully everyone can see the uh, slides again. I'll cover um, in, a, in a little bit of depth the Huawei data center portfolio. Uh, at the end of the day, what solutions are we providing in this space? Um, I would say probably best, it's probably best characterized that we run the gamut uh, of data center needs, and let's advance Mitch to the next slide, from, um, from solutions for data center switching, both modular and top of rack, to optical transmission, um, in which, uh, well, we actually have an extremely strong uh, worldwide um, market leadership position, securing for the data center, routing, uh, storage, and the, our end-to-end -end eSight management package that provides a single platform to address end-to-end -end management needs for both Huawei and third-party, both IT and IP devices, including other items such as printers. So really, um, as you increase the scope of what the network manager has to look at in the data center, it's extremely important to have one management package that, that in essence covers it all, and at the end of the day, eSight does. If you can join us in any of the trade shows along the way, such as an interop, or any of the other uh, many traders that we do participate in, love to give you a demo of that package. Um, together, these solutions allow our customers to build a data center solution that's scalable, fully virtualized, and of high quality. And in the next slide, few slides, I'll highlight these products and how they support a robust DC solution for the many verticals and customer types we serve. Just a few of those mentioned um, at the top of the slide, education, government, transportation, um, and, and many others. The first off here is our uh, data center switching portfolio. The, our Cloud Engine series specifically is a high performance cloud switch series designed for next generation data centers and high end campus networks. It includes the C12800 flagship core switches with the world's highest performance um, in switching for, for the space, as well as the top of rack solutions, the CE6800 and 5800 high performance box switches for both 10 and gigabit ethernet access. Uh, the CE series uses Huawei's next generation virtual routing platform version 8 software. The Cloud Engine 12800 series switches are next gen high performance core switches designed for data center networks and high end campuses. They provide stable, reliable, secure, and high performance L2, L3 switching capabilities to help build um, an elastic, virtualized, and high quality network. They provide as much as 64 terabits of switching capacity and high density line speed ports. And each switch has up to 128, 100 gig, 384, 40 gig, or 1536, 10 gig, uh, 10 giggy, excuse me, ports supported. And again, so you, you'll notice there is a smooth intergenerational scaling 
of the capacities between 10, 40, and 100. It's the same idea of the next generation investment I talked about that can take, take you well into the next 10 and beyond years when you make the initial investment. The Cloud Engine 6800 series are next generation 10 gig Ethernet switches designed for data centers and high-end campus networks. The switches provide high performance, high density 10 gig ports and low latency. The hardware has an advanced architectural design with 40 gig up, 40 gig uplink ports and the industry's highest density of 10 gig access ports. Using the Huawei VRP8 software, as I mentioned, they provide extensive data center service features and high stacking capability. And in addition, the airflow direction through ventilation channels can be changed. They can work, obviously, with the C12800 switches to build an elastic, virtualized, and high-quality fabric, meeting the requirements of cloud computing data centers that our customers are building daily. So moving on then, while robust data center switching is a great cornerstone to the data center, customers worry about several other items when they think of this area of their network. Clearly, high availability for the data center is extremely important given the nature of the data that resides there. And we do provide an industry two-level IP plus optical synergy disaster prevention and recovery solution. On the left-hand side of the slide, I'm showing my combination of IP and optical disaster recovery. First, Huawei NE40E routers implement flexible interconnection and IP SAN backup between data centers. These routers support hardware-based bidirectional forwarding detection, which shortens the network convergence time. Optical transmission devices that I, sh I show below are capable of transmitting mass data for um, data level disaster recovery between the primary and backup data centers. The devices that I'm listing there can support a total of 14 types of SAN interfaces, such as fiber channel, FICON, and SCON, and have gained compatibility certificates from six mainstream storage device vendors. The optical line is called the OSN line, and each OSN device has the capability of 40, 100 gig and times a total of 80 channels for a total of 8 terabits of throughput. The capacity of the OSN can easily be increased using additional channels and it can establish a SAN of the longest distance in the industry, roughly 3,000 kilometers end to end, making it possible for super long distance disaster recovery. More, moreover, we do implement carrier class 50 millisecond protection switching. The next slide, please. Thanks, Mitch. Security of key data is another area on top of disaster recovery that's of extreme importance to our customers. Huawei Data Center Security provides a comprehensive security protection and hierarchical security deployment for intranet and external connections. It's composed of the following components. Number one, the Huawei series firewall, which integrates a firewall, IPS IDS, antivirus, secure VPN, anti-DDoS, and online behavior management in one platform. This integrated security solution reduces your costs on devices and not, uh, network operation and maintenance. Huawei recommends hierarchical security deployment in the data center. Firewalls are first deployed at the data center egress to filter out risky external traffic and defend against intrusion from external users. The data center intranet is divided into multiple zones by service. Different security policies are applied to the zones for service isolation and access control. In the management zone, administrators are authenticated and security logs are recorded. The network management system can analyze associated security events based on the security logs and generate pre-alarms or provide information for later security audit. Finally, our firewall series can provide the highest performance in the industry with a 200 gig firewall throughput. 5 million per second connections established, and 320,000 concurrent IPsec tunnels. As I mentioned, end-to-end -end network management is extremely important in the data center. Network visibility and control is key, and eSight is Huawei's end-to-end -end network management package to provide that. It includes integrated wired and wireless management, network quality visualization, network traffic visualization, and MPLS VPN visualization. So you have all three of those that you're able to do out of one package. 
eSight today, it's in its newest version, builds on earlier generations of a solution to incorporate specific solutions targeted at data centers, cloud computing, and BYOD all in one, all in one package. So at the end of the day, this is a package that is extensible from your data center implementation to your cloud computing needs and even to your BYOD implementation that Huawei provides. And Mitch, I think at this point, before we get into our case studies, I believe we wanted to turn to our polling question number three. Was that correct? Absolutely. So let me pull that up. So this polling question um, deals with who is your primary vendor for data center switching technologies. And we list a few uh, of the obvious names there, Cisco, Dell, Brocade, uh, HP, and then we even give you an opportunity to say, hey, we don't, we don't like those guys, we got somebody else. So um, please uh, just uh, answer the question and uh, we will share the results momentarily. Give it just a few uh, more seconds here. I still see a few answers coming in. Okay. So taking a look at the results, uh, it looks like uh, Cisco is by and large the, uh, the favor there, uh, followed by uh, other. Uh, then we have HP um, and uh, Brocade and then Dell, uh, Dell pulling up the rear. So uh, interesting results. I uh, can't say this one surprises me as much as the last one. Uh, it doesn't surprise me either, Mitch. Uh, one uh, additional note I will make there, however, is I, I hope to make much uh, more of the other B-Huawei in the very near future Absolutely. with these customers, and that's obviously the purpose of these webinars. Uh, moving then on very quickly, Mitch, to the, uh, the latter part of our presentation here as time draws short. I would like to share with you a couple of uh, extremely interesting, I think, just because of the matter they cover and the, the challenges our customers face of uh, data center implementations. My first customer is a European organization for nuclear research, the largest nuclear research center in the world. It's commonly referred to in the vernacular as CERN, and it was established in Geneva, Switzerland, September of 1954. So these folks have been at their research for a very long time, and what they do, Mitch, is they conduct research on subatomic particles and their behavior. And so if you can imagine the petabytes of data that these folks um, really are producing here in this type of a science where, they're in essence, you know, with all that atom smashing, the millions of data points that each one of those experiments requires. So if you think about the critical requirements my customers were looking at in this case, clearly high reliability. I've got 7,000 plus of the world's top science engineers not just in Geneva, but in facilities across the world as they share their research, depending upon that network, that storage, um, those data center devices for their research. Uh, very high scalability. They, um, they added seven petabytes in 2007. They added uh, 50 more petabytes um, up to the storage pool in 2009 and jumped up 25 petabytes in 2012. And then finally, um, high performance. They're looking at over, as I mentioned, 20 petabytes of data growth per year from things like the, the Large Hadron Collider L or LHC experiments. What, we, what the Huawei produced and the, the customer purchased was a UDS cloud storage system, helping CERN to meet the challenges of, of that level of IT infrastructure. The direct customer benefits, Mitch, were obviously our, our, our innovative cloud storage solutions demonstrated excellent reading and writing ability and excellent capability in the large 20 petabyte large scale data environments. The system also has an intelligent self repair function which reduces maintenance costs by up to 45% from their previous solution and it improves clearly the availability and reliability of the storage system as well. And, and so you, you might think, you know, gee, um, uh, I'm an enterprise but I certainly don't have the requirements of a CERN. At the end of the day, if you're in big data at all, if that's something that you're looking at or even large tracts of customer information, some of these numbers will start looking somewhat familiar to you as those storage needs grow. 
And so I think there certainly are some characteristics of the Huawei storage solution that are extensible into many customer environments. My second and last customer um, today is, is more of a data center switching customer. SCC, or Specialist Computer Centers, is Europe's largest independent IT group and provides services for large-scale enterprises, government, and public organizations covering Britain and most European countries. And they had a classic aging data center problem. They had current um, two data centers um, connected across a, a DCI link, data center and interconnect link, with aging network infrastructure. And as services and customers, as you can imagine, were being added rapidly, they found existing devices were certainly running out of the horsepower to meet those new data center requirements. A classic data center upgrade was thus needed. And critical requirements for that upgrade included two things. Number one, much larger switching capacity. And number two, as I mentioned, scaling of that layer two network via Trill uh, supporting DCI or data center interconnection scaling. The customer found the solution with Huawei's Cloud Engine modular and top of rack solutions. The networks of the two office areas, as I mentioned, um, use the Cloud Engine 12800 as core devices. The two data centers use Cloud Engine 6800 to perform stacking for 10 gig server access. The core and access devices are connected using 40 gig, as I mentioned, the need to scale that, that interconnection. And the two data centers and offices use C6800's running Trill to provide a large-scale Layer 2 net. So obviously the benefits to the customer in this case include high-speed switching. Uh, the data centers use a 40 gig interconnection, as I mentioned, greatly improving service efficiency. And uh, the large Layer 2 loop-free uh, network is the other benefit. The link use uses efficiently, in essence, has doubled meeting requirements for server virtualization and wide service migration. And so that's my second and final customer example today. Moving on to the final slide then as we summarize here as we reach our, our time limit. Huawei, um, I get this question a lot. At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's about products and services, but it's also about your ability uh, to service them. And, and so what's the story there, Huawei, in the U.S.? And we're glad to report uh, that Huawei Enterprise U.S. can avail of itself of over 1,100 field engineers and 240 stocking locations. We do provide same-day service to 40,000 locations throughout the U.S. and next day at all zip codes, continental and non-continental United States. We provide three types of services, professional, training and certification, and technical. And those are, whether they be either partner brand or a Huawei brand, um, we have various options that will, that will probably fit any scenario that you can throw at us. So at this point, Mitch, I'm concluding uh, the slides presentation, and I'd like to move uh, directly into Q&A. And I do have one that I know a lot of people have asked in the past, and I'll start with that one, Mitch. And that, that's, that's um, great to know that you've got this cloud engine. Do you have any testing results? And so again, um, for those who need a little refresher, the cloud engine series switches are high-performance cloud switches designed for next-generation data centers and high-end campus networks. The series includes the C12800 flagship core switches with the, with the world's highest performance in throughput, and the C6800, 5800 high performance box switches for 10 gig and gig access. They do use Huawei's next generation VRP8 software. And the, so the question is, do you have testing results available? As a matter of fact, we absolutely do. Independent agency, Myercom, um, tested the performance of both the Cloud Engine 12800 the 6800 and the 5800, and those results are available under Myercom.com, <coughs> again, M-I-E-R-C-O-M.com, and simply type in, in the search window, the device that you're looking at, and the, the test results should pop up. Second question I've got here, and this is a very common one, there's a lot of jargon in the SDN space. Can you, and I've heard about this thing called open daylight, can you clearly define SDN, and how open daylight relates to it, and I'd be glad to do that. So as I mentioned very briefly during uh, the webinar, SDN enables users to program network layers separating the control plane and the data plane. And by enabling this programmability, SDN can enable users to optimize the network resources, increase network agility, service innovation, accelerate service time to market, and ultimately extract business intelligence 
for more dynamic, service-driven virtual network. The need for SDN, therefore, should be reasonably clear, but one of the challenges in implementing SDN to this day is that the approach to virtualizing the network layer and adding programmability have left the industry fragmented and making, and making adoption of SDN complex. So leading SDN uh, um, vendors, including Huawei, have realized there has to be an end to the log jam in order to move SDN forward. And so Open Daylight is an effort to do exactly that. It's a collaborative, open source project to advance software-defined networking. It's a community-led, open, industry-supported framework consisting of code and blueprints for accelerating adoption, fostering new innovation, reducing risk, and creating a more transparent approach to SDN. I've got a, next, Mitch, I've got a follow-up on our service and support question. Perhaps we, after that we can take one or two from the audience itself. Um, <clears throat> follow-up to this slide you showed on support. Does Huawei offer data center-specific services? And what types of SLAs do you have? So we absolutely do provide data center-level services. Our high care maintenance umbrella is what you need to be looking for on our website. And it has, it's available with three levels of response. Our standard response and nine, 9 to 5 business hours coverage and next business day hardware shipments is available. Our enhanced coverage provides 9 to 5 coverage and 4 hour replacement hardware delivery. And finally, there's a premier level of service which provides 24 by 7 coverage with 4 hour hardware replacement. All service levels are offered with 24 by 7 call center and online support and with on-site hardware replacement. And so, Mitch, let's, let's pull up one or two of the uh, of the online questions, perhaps, and see how we can address. Great. Um, honestly, the uh, the biggest question that came through today was, uh, can we get copies of the slides? Uh, there's lots of great information in these slides, and we would like to uh, like to have them. So definitely, uh, they are available. Uh, you can shoot an email to me uh, at mitch at demandbydesign.com, and I will get you uh, the slides. In addition to the slides, we'll have a recording of this webinar up uh, for uh, view later today, and I will send out an email to everybody uh, who was on uh, today, and you'll be able to, uh, to view it. So uh, I, with that, I, I think that concludes our uh, webinar today. I hope, Fair enough. I hope everybody found it uh, enjoyable as well as informative, and we're going to look forward to uh, talking with you in the future uh, as customers and partners. Thank you again. Thank you very much.